So the first thing I would like to tell you all is why I picked this topic, why radiation? And it's actually a rather humbling story. I was around 26 years old. I was teaching at Parkland Community College in Champaign-Urbana. I was still a graduate student and I was teaching general chemistry and we got to the chapter on nuclear chemistry. And that would have been in the early 80s. And I, in front of the whole class, I pretty much repeated a lot of what was popular zeitgeist, you know, like the, the negative attitudes about nuclear power, how um, radiation was dangerous. And I hadn't done my homework. So after class, one of the students came up to me and she said, I, I need to talk with you. And I'm like, okay, no problem. And she said, you know, my father is the chief engineer at the nuclear power plant here. And you made a lot of statements that are not accurate. And she said, I feel you have a responsibility when you set yourself up as an expert to know what you're talking about. And wow, <laughs> I have never forgotten that lesson because in that moment, I realized she was totally right. I had not done my homework. I had not learned about um, nuclear power. I had never been to a nuclear power plant. I didn't know anything about any of the material other than you know the stuff that's in the very dry basic chemistry textbook about what is fusion, what is fission and so on. And so I decided that that would not happen again and I would start to learn. So not too many years ago, I actually went to Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is me in the uh, Nuclear Museum of Science and History. Why Albuquerque? Because it's very close to the Trinity site and we did drive out to that. This is where the world's first nuclear device was exploded in July 16th, 1945. So that's me standing there for a camera moment. And more interestingly, this was, this was among the rocks that we could pick up. And then we could walk over to a table where they had a Geiger counter and we could see that they were in fact radioactive still. And these are a particular mineral that didn't exist until we exploded the first nuclear um, bomb. It's called trinitite. It looks like it might be trinitite, but it's trinitite because this is in, is in Trinity. And interestingly enough, Trinity was named for the Trinity, you know, the Christian Trinity of um, God, Son, Holy Ghost, that Trinity, at, because at that time it was felt that we were unlocking. Um, some kind of very deep universal secrets. This glass is green, as is any kind of glass that's made with uranium, and I'll have a piece to show you later. So here's a kind of mind map that I found on the internet, and I also made my own um, mind map, and I'm going to show that to you as well. So I'm going to stop the share for a minute and switch cameras. OK. So the mind map I started to make was just kind of doodling as I connected radiation to many, many different topics. And by the time I got done playing this game of mind mapping, I realized that radiation sort of connected to everything, but then why shouldn't it? The universe has matter and it has energy and energy and radiation are um, intimately connected. And I'll explain how. One thing you can see right here on the mind map is these electromagnetic spectrum. And in order to talk about that, I'm just going to point out 
the anatomy of a wave. Now, those of you that are scientists know this already, so pretend for a moment that you're students and seeing this for the first time. When you talk about the anatomy of the wave, there's really three things we have to be clear about. One is amplitude. How tall is the wave? That's called amplitude. And if you were talking about, for example, a sound wave, a sound wave, amplitude would relate to how loud the sound is. When you talk about light, amplitude is related to how bright the light is. But the other two words are frequency and wavelength. And frequency is how many cycles go by in a certain period of time. And wavelength is the physical distance, like in meters, between two peaks. And so this is a perfect sine wave. That's why it's symmetrical and has a regular um, form. Uh, waves can become much more complicated. But the main idea is that the greater the frequency of a wave, the greater the energy of what we call a photon. And this leads us to a discussion I'm not going to delve into about wave particle duality. Suffice it to say that electromagnetic energy, as we know it, can be described as behaving like waves or behaving like particles. And when it behaves like particles, we call those particles photons. When it behaves like waves, then we can perhaps relate that in our mind to other waves like sound waves or even water waves. But the energy is related to the frequency, the frequency, the number of cycles per second. You can also think about that in the unit Hertz, cycles per second. So here is the electromagnetic spectrum. And at the very low, frequency side, we have things like radio and television. Then we come up to microwaves and we get into heat, which is infrared. Then we have our optical spectrum, Roy G. Biv. That's how I learned it, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And I never quite knew what indigo was. I just said purple in my mind, but indigo, is I guess kind of a blue purple. And then above violet is ultraviolet. And this is where we start to hit a kind of radiation known as ionizing. Above ultraviolet, we have our X-rays and finally our gamma rays. Notice that once we reach into the range of ionizing, we have the possibility of breaking chemical bonds. We have the possibility of damaging DNA. So what about microwaves? Let's start with that one. So I'm going to give you a little quiz here. <laughs> if microwaves are not ionizing radiation, how do they cook the food? And answer in the chat, if you would, please. Just answer in the chat. How do they cook the food? I know some of you know this, some of you don't, but I'm treating you as if you were my student audience. So give me an answer in the chat. Anybody? How do microwaves cook food? Good answer, Mila. And Zeke, you are right. The reason why they can cook food is because microwave radiation happens to be absorbed by the water molecule. And when that energy is absorbed, no bonds are broken. There's no ionization that takes place, but the water molecule begins to vibrate. And as it vibrates, it undergoes more collisions. As it undergoes more collisions, we have kinetic energy, which is then experienced as heat and anything with water in it heats up. Some things don't have water in them like some of the plastic containers, so they don't get hot in the microwave. Second question, how are the microwaves in a microwave oven different from the microwaves you always hear about with cell phones? How are they different? They're both called microwaves. Any idea about this one?
Okay, no one's, oh, the frequencies are, are not as different as you might expect. Um, a microwave oven is typically around 2.45 gigahertz, but cell tower frequencies are now reaching even as high as 4.7 gigahertz. Although this 5G doesn't stand for gigahertz, it stands for fifth generation, just to be clear on that. But no, the frequencies are in the range of microwaves. So it's not about frequency. So what else could it be about? Mila, let's not go there quite yet. What it's about is intensity, about total energy. A typical microwave is up around 700 to 1,000 watts. That's joules per second. That's energy per time. So it's up around 700 to 1,000 watts. A cell phone is operating in the 0 0.02 watt range. So there's a huge difference in intensity with a cell phone. And we'll come back to some of these questions that you're putting in the chat. Don't worry, we'll come back to them. What about infrared radiation? There's one word that you can associate infrared radiation with. Anyone guess what that word is? Just keep answering in the chat. One word. Yes, Zeke, good, you got it. So these are some pictures taken with an infrared camera. And what happens in an infrared camera is that infrared radiation is emitted by everything. Everything that has a temperature is emitting some, some well, everything was probably the wrong word to use there. I forget I have all these scientists here. Many, many things emit infrared radiation, including most of the things around your house. So this is my freezer in the basement but you can see that you don't get something for nothing. So if it's cold on the inside, the heat's gotta come out somewhere. So this is the heat coming out uh, through the radiating along the outside of the freezer. Now I cannot see these pipes with my eyes, but when I take a picture with an infrared camera, it allows me to see inside the freezer, but not because it's sending rays through the metal. No, what's happening is the heat is dissipating out of the freezer and coming towards my camera. This is a picture of a um, water barrel in my backyard and through, ver through the um, infrared camera, I can see where the water level is, something I can't see if I'm just looking at the barrel. And here's my dog and you can see where um, his hotspots are. And this is showing the leaking of heat from my house and the entry of cold air into my house. So these cameras are very useful to determine, to determine, um, you know, insulation in a home. And this one is a real funny one. I took this to the grocery store and there was a woman that was testing out the grapefruits and this is evidence that she tested every single one she could because this is her heat signature being left on these grapefruits. So what is ionizing radiation? Well, by definition, in that electromagnetic spectra, any parts of that spectra that have enough energy to ionize the medium they pass through or particles moving at high enough speeds that have the ability to ionize the medium through which they pass. So here comes our first big confusion. We have electromagnetic radiation, but we also have particles which are associated with radiation. These are the particles that are associated with radiation. We have alpha radiation, which is alpha particles, those come from um, inside a nucleus and are ejected at very, very high speeds. You can see down here that they travel 
as high as 32,000 kilometers per second, just by comparison, the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. So they don't reach the speed of light, but they travel very fast. However, they're, they're massive, they have mass, they have the mass of um, the same as a, inside of a helium atom, and they're stopped by a piece of paper. They don't go through a piece of paper. So we say they're not penetrating, they're not penetrating. Beta particles is another name for an electron that comes out of the nucleus. And this can happen when a neutron releases an electron and then itself becomes a proton. So when these beta particles, these fast moving electrons come out of the nucleus, they're traveling even as high as 99% the speed of light. They're able to go through paper, but they're stopped by aluminum foil. So we have a good reason for making those hats out of aluminum foil. It's not just the aliens. We can also stop beta particles. And finally, there's gamma radiation. And gamma radiation is the radiation that is on the electromagnetic spectrum. So it has no mass. It consists of these photon particles or packets of energy. And it is much more penetrating. But even so, it can be stopped with lead. Then there's one other type of radiation that ends up affecting us not by directly ionizing the medium it passes through, but by interacting with other atoms. And then those atoms through secondary effects can release alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. So these neutrons can be divided into uh, categories called fast neutrons and slow neutrons. And the tendency of fast neutrons to be absorbed by hydrogen is what makes neutron radiation especially biologically dangerous because the uh, neutrons, because they can interact with hydrogen and hydrogen is like 65% of the atoms in our body, then they can certainly uh, impact. So do you remember what four types I mentioned? Can you list them? in the chat, the four types of ionizing radiation. Anyone want to list them or list one of them and we can build on that? You forgot already? Think Greek. There you go. Alpha, beta, gamma, neutron. You got it. Good job. Okay, so let's look at some timelines. So this timeline is pretty comprehensive, but it was from a website that indicates it was made in the UK. What's the clue? Well, pounds instead of dollars is one clue. And I could not find one this pretty that that was, you know, USA timeline, but this one does well. So it starts with the accidental discovery of X-rays and ionizing radiation. That happened as far back as 1895. Then as you travel along, here we get to uh, Pierre and Marie Curie and their discovery of radium and subsequently polonium and uh, the spontaneous emission of radioactivity. And then it's not, it's as, it's as, it was in 1902 that Rutherford finally elucidated the nuclear atom, the atom that more or less we, we think of today with a very concentrated center and then electrons on the outside somehow. Einstein came up with equals MC squared in 1905. Um, and so as we go along, I just wanna point out a few other interesting time events. For example, Three Mile Island was the breakdown of um, the pot, you know, it almost went critical core of a nuclear power plant. Uh, don't let me skip uh, 39 to 45, the Manhattan Project, where we developed a nuclear bomb. In 1954, here they talk about the Atomic Energy Act, but this was also when we tested the biggest bomb we've ever exploded on the planet. It was a hydrogen bomb. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. We have the Chernobyl accident, which may be fresher in your minds because of 
the mini TV mini series that was on not too long ago. Then we have some time, some time, and finally we get to the mo most recent nuclear uh, power accident, which was Fukushima Daiichi. So three major power plant accidents and the years for extra credit. Do you, do you have them off the top of your head? I know for me, unless I actually work to memorize the years, they're not going to come to me. But the names of the three accidents are kind of carved into my mind. Um, who knows them? Who can put one of them out there? Chernobyl. Yeah, Chernobyl's one or Chernobyl. And what else? Fukushima. And yes, Nagasaki. Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi in Japan. And finally, one more, the earliest one of all. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. No, that was not a nuclear power plant. Those were uh, uh, atomic bombs that were dropped on cities. So the earliest one is Three Mile Island. Right, Robert? Right. OK, so another way of looking, though, at the timeline of nuclear radiation is to look at it through radiotherapy. And this is um, a little bit blurry. I couldn't find the original without paying 30 some dollars for the article. But this is the reason why I put this here is to remind everyone that in spite of the fact that what sticks in our mind is some of the horrific things like bombs and, and power plant accidents and so on, we also have been developing more and more ways of treating cancer through radiotherapy and through brachiotherapy. And brachiotherapy refers to putting the radioactive source as close to the tumor as possible. So that's not done with x-rays, that's done with radioisotopes that can be placed inside the body. So I wanna take you on a little tour of time. And these are iconic images through the years that show how the public has often perceived radiation. And I subtitled it, The Rise of Fear. And you will see why. So when, when Rentgen first experimented with a radioactive source and was able to expose a photograph, he photographic film, really quickly, he brought his wife in to take the very first x-ray. So this is Mrs. Röntgen with her uh, wedding ring on her hand. And of course, when she saw this, she was horrified. Her famous quote is, I have seen my death. And apparently she never stepped foot in his lab again. I don't know if that's for real or not, but that was reported. But shortly thereafter, the public began to connect the ideas of radiation and radioactivity that was newly discovered with ancient ideas of the philosopher's stone. You know, the philosopher's stone that could make you rich and make you live forever the ultimate dream of the alchemist, well, that came, became conflated with these new glowing rays. It's not the first time in history that that's happened. With the discovery of phosphorus, it was believed that the elixir of life and had, been, had been uncovered because phosphorus glowed. So this is glowing. This is x-rays. And so, well, you can see here it cures cancer, consumption, tuberculosis, and you should have your own source of, of um, x-rays in your home. This was the beginning of the radium paint. The radium paint, which has a rather sad, sad trajectory to its story, but when it first started out, it was called Undark and you paint it little watch dials, and then those watch dials glowed in the dark. And I actually had one of those watches when I was five, and I remember it 
very well because my father gave it to me and I would wear it. And then in the middle of the night, if I woke up, I'd wear it in bed. And in the middle of the night, if I woke up, I could see what time it was. <laughs> I remember thinking that was amazing. This was before light emitting diodes, folks. This was when nothing glowed in the dark. So this was pretty amazing. Um, here's just an old ad about radium. You put a little radium into water and then you drink the water and it does what? It cures everything again. It cures rheumatism, gout, headaches. The only thing that probably saved a lot of toxicity from these early um, products is that they probably had no radium in them. It, it's it wasn't that easy to get a hold of. It was incredibly expensive. Now in 1914, H.G. Wells wrote a book called The World Set Free. And you know, H.G. Wells was well known for being a prophet of the future. And in this book, he imagined that now that we've unlocked this force inside the atom, that it was too dangerous for ordinary people to control. So he imagined a world in which we came to the brink of destruction, but then we established a new world order. It was the whole world, not just a country. And this new world order was run by, who do you think? By scientists. Scientists were set up as the new rulers. Here's just a cosmetic ad. So now we're, we're dealing with gray hair and it's supposed to ungray your hair. Um, here we're drinking it, radioactive water from our refrigerator. By the time we hit 1936, there were starting to be some very interesting public perceptions. I recently watched this movie. I actually loved it. It was a classic. Um, in this movie, this substance is discovered and it has these rays and these rays can cure diseases. They could take a blind person and shoot these rays at them and they would see again. However, it had a dark side. The person who, the doctor who discovered this radioactive material became himself radioactive. He started to glow in the dark. He goes crazy and he starts killing people until eventually he self-destructs and there's no body because he just disappears. Um, this was the first superhero to have X-ray eyes, but her X-ray eyes didn't just allow her to see inside you to see your bones. Her X-ray eyes were able to see in your heart, in your intentions she developed some kind of x-ray psychic power. But here comes some dark news. So in 1938, it was beginning to be realized that those girls who were painting the clock dials with their little brushes that they were licking in order to get a good point on them, they were dying of a cancer of the jaw. Now it turns out that radium in the periodic table is in the same column as calcium. And whenever an element is in the same column, it means it has similar chemical properties. And so radium is able to get inside the bone. And once it gets inside the bone, even though it is a um, beta emitter, might be alpha emitter, I'll have to check. But even though it emits particles that don't penetrate very far, they don't have to penetrate very far if they're actually inside the bones. And so this was the beginning of the awareness that ingesting something is very, very different than having it on the outside of your body. And ultimately, these women uh, tended to die fairly young and before their, their lawsuits were ever settled, um, most of them were not able to collect any compensation. Then, of course, in 1945, the bomb was dropped. The first bomb was dropped. On August 6th, 
on Hiroshima. This was the uh, uranium bomb. This was a fission bomb. And by 1947, we're already beginning to get over that. And there was a whole campaign called Atoms for Peace. And the idea was, OK, fine, we have bombs. They're pretty horrible. They scare people. The public was beginning to be very scared at that point of what was going on in the scientific laboratories. So a campaign was started to explain that it's not all bad. It's not all bad. We can use it for good things too. We just have to understand it better. But at the same time, and coincident with this, the Cold War was building and a whole campaign was launched to explain how to survive a nuclear attack. And this was the duck and cover campaign led by the turtle. And the turtle, of course, withdraws into its shell and as it withdraws into a shell, he's telling all of us, if we just get into a shelter, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. No problem. And so drills were instituted. And there are some very um, contradictory messages going on here, because at the same time that you're supposed to duck and cover, if you're a boy, you might be able to get your very own atomic energy lab and start experimenting with atomic energy at home with your own Geiger counter and your own little piece of uranium. But you go to school and you learn how to wear a gas mask. And the bomb building didn't stop. Throughout the uh, 50s, experiments were done with hydrogen bombs. And the thing about hydrogen bombs is that it sounds like they're fusion bombs because they get enough energy to fuse hydrogen. And this in and of itself does not produce any radioactive fallout. However, in order to get to that level, you have to start with fission. And in this particular explosion, they miscalculated the fission of lithium. They thought that only one kind of lithium, lithium-6 would undergo fission and that was only one third of the lithium in the bomb. But oops, lithium seven also underwent fission and the bomb ended up detonating two to three times more powerful than the scientists had calculated. Unfortunately, there were some pretty horrible issues as a result of that. There was a lot of nuclear material that was created in the dust in the atmosphere, and this traveled in the atmosphere as far away as Japan, and rained down like snow, like snow that wasn't cold, on a fishing boat where 23 crew members were contaminated. And this began for them a rather horrific experience of being guinea pigs. They were hospitalized at the United States expense, all expenses paid, medical tests done on you, kept in the hospital. Uh, one of them died uh, very, very shortly thereafter. Most of them did live, but, but they eventually had a variety of health impacts. And interestingly enough, that same year, later in the year, the movie Godzilla was released. So Godzilla was first released in Japan before the American release. And Godzilla came to symbolize for many interpreters, the West. The West with their monstrous creation of nuclear bombs. But we are constantly optimistic. And for every negative image, you can find someone that was trying to tell a positive story. So in 1956, this book came out, Our Friend the Atom, that was written by Walt Disney. And there's also a movie that goes along with this, very cheerful, very upbeat. And in it, it expresses three wishes. The wish for power, interesting first wish. The second wish, 
for food and health. And the third wish for peace, for peace from this, this genie that we let out of the bottle, because that was the metaphor that Disney used. Disney used the metaphor that the genie was released from the bottle, but it wasn't a bad genie. It was just a genie we needed to talk with and have good interactions with. In 1957, Neville Shute wrote a famous book called On the Beach. In this book, everybody dies. I've read it, it's a real downer. Um, everybody dies because we get nuclear winter. We get a fallout that starts in one location, slowly spreads over the whole planet. And finally, there's a small group of people still in Australia, confronting sterile oceans, confronting the entire breakdown of all ecosystems, no more birds, no more insects. And they're the last and they take their own lives and then the book's over. Um, but then came the 60s and the 60s once again took a positive slant on all this. Okay, fine, radioactivity's out there. It does stuff to us, but maybe it can turn us into superheroes. And so the Fantastic Four were hit by gamma rays and developed each unique powers. Uh, Spider-Man was bit by a radioactive spider and then he developed his powers. And I think from the more recent movies, we've learned that with great power comes great responsibility. Um, then we have, <laughs> we have ads still coming out to build your own radiation survival gear. Uh, the Incredible Hulk was hit by gamma rays and became a monster, but you know, he just wasn't able to control his anger. And as long as he stayed in control of his anger, he wouldn't be a monster. And then we have Superman's X-ray vision. It made its first appearance in 1962 and he was able to look through a piece of cloth and see the underlying cloth. If you've been paying attention to um, the pennant, you know, the ability of, of rays to penetrate, you might already be seeing a problem. There's a lot of problems, but let's just go with this for a moment. And this was the first evidence that he could somehow see inside of things. 1964, Dr. Strangelove came out. It was a black comedy, uh, a sort of a spoof on how bomb dropping could get out of control, but just go with it. And then in 1964, and again, we're talking about my childhood here. I'll never forget the episode of Gilligan's Island when seeds washed ashore. They planted them all before they realized they were radioactive <clears throat> and they grew giant, giant vegetables and were enjoying a wonderful variety of things they hadn't eaten for a long time until the professor had his Geiger counter that he'd probably made out of coconuts or something and realized they were all radioactive. And this episode resolved very nicely. It turned out that all they had to do to get rid of their ra ra the radioactivity was to eat soap. And then their ra radioactivity went down. By 1979, we had nuclear power plants and we were starting to worry about them. Interestingly enough, it was March 16th, 1979, that China syndrome came out Ironically, Three Mile Island happened after this movie was made. I would have thought it was the other way around that Three Mile Island inspired this movie, but it was actually the reverse. It anticipated the Three Mile Island accident, which was in um, March. And then in the 80s, we um, I went and saw this movie. It was making fun of the duck and cover propaganda campaign by juxtaposing images of actual uh, bombs exploding next to the very fragile structures of school rooms and children ducking under their desks. So the children are ducking under their desks, 
but the bomb images being shown are blowing up whole cities. So this was meant to be uh, funny and terrifying at the same time, and this was the 80s. In 83, we had the movie Silkwood, uh, which was about the corruption that can happen in a nuclear plant that led to um, not following the rules and not reporting problems, and then that leads to disaster. And then uh, in 86, we had the biggest nuclear power plant disaster ever, and that was Chernobyl. And Dr. Manhattan was born. And Dr. Manhattan, unlike all the other superheroes we've seen so far, Dr. Manhattan gets trapped in a radioactive particle test. His entire body is destroyed down to the molecular level, but he's rebuilt his body. And at this point, he's not just a super person. He's not even human anymore. For all intents and purposes, Dr. Manhattan has become a god. A lot of stuff to unpack there. Uh, McCarthy wrote The Road in 2006, which was the bleakest uh, view of nuclear winter. It's the story of a man and his son as they travel through a devastated landscape. If you had to put it next to On the Beach, I would say that it's even more bleak, if that's even possible because it pulls at the heartstrings as the man um, tries to explain to his child what's going on. And then this was from a recent uh, article in uh, the New York Times. This is a cartoon that was introducing the article and it was addressing the topic of people being afraid of microwave towers and their cell phones. So the point I'm making with all of these images is that we have a deeply ingrained fear of radiation in our public psyche. It's not just fear of ionizing radiation, it's fear of all radiation. And it doesn't matter how you're exposed to it, whether it's on your outsides or on your insides or whether you eat it, it doesn't matter what the dosage is. It doesn't matter the frequency. You hear the word radiation, radiation equals fear. And this is problematic. What is radiation actually? Well, actually we're all exposed to radiation. Every single day we're exposed to radiation. There's something called background radiation. It comes from all kinds of different sources. For example, the ground beneath your feet is radioactive, rocks are radioactive, space is radioactive, and we all get an annual average dosage. And we tend to do just fine. In fact, I would argue that if there was no radiation, there would be no evolution. If there was no evolution, we would not be here. Some of the types of radiations uh, I mean, the radiations are lined up here with a sort of Q factor. The Q factor helps us put them in some kind of proportion to how biologically interactive they are. And when you start to talk about the units of radioactivity and radiation, it can be extremely confusing. But let me break it down for you. There are units that talk about the source of the radiation and how many click, 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 clicks you get on a Geiger counter. There are units that talk about how much goes into you. What do you actually absorb? And finally, there are units which take the first and the second into account and then also take into account how much that radiation interacts with your biological system. And those are the units that are the most important of all. RBE stands for relative biological effectiveness. So we need to be concerned with sieverts or REMS. If you're into the metric system, I say use sieverts. That's the international unit for talking about how much exposure you are getting. And here's another chart that just shows the same thing, but it shows it in more detail. It shows uh, how uh, some of the calculations are made. 
And it makes a difference whether the radiation is hitting your whole body or just a very specific part of your body. So it matters how focused radiation is. So here's a chart that shows dosages. And you can see that right here, the worldwide dose is at 2.4 millisieverts, 2.4 millisieverts. In order to die, you have to get between 7,000 and 10,000. You'll start getting sick at 1,000. If you work in the industry of radioactivity, they allow you in Singapore to get 20 millisieverts a year, way, way below the 1,000 that makes you sick, but might account for being cautious about long-term effects. If you get one CT scan, you're gonna get about nine millisieverts. And so that's one way of trying to put things into perspective. You know, there are foods that are naturally radioactive. There are foods that emit radioactive um, particles. Here's a few of them right here. And we can put everything in terms of bananas. So these, this is radioactivity in terms of bananas. So if you stand close to one banana, you're exposed to 0.1 micro sieverts. And for those of you who are not up on the metric system, micro is a thousand times less than milli. So back to milli sieverts, this number would become 0 0.0001, much, much small, very small dosage. But if you had 50 bananas, you'd be at the level of a dental x-ray. If you had 100 bananas, well, that's like 100 grams of Brazil nuts. <coughs> if you get on an airplane, you're up to 800 bananas. Your average annual dose, if you live in the UK, again, they have the prettiest charts, the, the, their, their public materials that I can find on the internet. So this is another UK um, image I snatched. Uh, 27,000 bananas. And finally, a lethal dosage would be 50 million bananas. So I strongly suggest that you never stand next to 50 million bananas and definitely don't eat 50 million bananas in a short period of time. Now we need to say a little bit about half-lives because half-lives is how long radioactivity lasts. And this is very, very, very confused and confusing in the public, because if the radioactive source is gone, it's gone. <laughs> and we hear a lot about radioactive isotopes that have really long half-lives, but they don't all have really long half-lives. So a half-life by definition is the time it takes for half the original amount to decay away. And another half-life gives half of the half. And another half-life gives half of the half of the half. So by the time you've gone through five half-lives, 97% of the original material has become something else. What else and how long? Here's a chart of some really common isotopes. Let me just point out a few things. Americium. Americium is in your smoke detectors. It's in your smoke detectors. In fact, reading on the back of this, it says, contains a maximum of 37 kilobecquerels, one microcurie of americium-241. Americium sticks around for 432 years times five. So your smoke detectors are gonna keep working, but the radioactivity that they produce travels a very short distance inside the smoke detector and is only interrupted when particles get in the way because it's alpha particles. So it can be stopped by just a little tiny piece of ash, like from a smoke. And that is why the alarm goes off because it interrupts the beam. But we all rely on these smoke detectors. Another example is iodine-131. You always hear about, oh, go get the potassium iodide, Fukushima, just had a meltdown and we, we're all going to get irradiated with iodine. So go get your potassium iodide tablets so you can 
supersaturate your thyroid so nothing radioactive will get in because our thyroids store iodine. It lasts for eight days. So eight times five, 40 days. Don't drink any milk for 40 days. Don't eat the local produce for 40 days and it's gone. The iodine-131 has decayed away. Uranium-235 lasts 710 million years. For 710 million years, it keeps giving off alpha particles. But the reverse of lasting a long time, the reverse of that is not having as many particles come out per unit time. They get spread over much greater units of time. Why do I think we should all learn about this topic? Well, there are people that are afraid to eat food that's been irradiated. Irradiating food does not make it radioactive. It kills bacteria and makes it safer to eat. It doesn't carry any of that radioactivity with it. Um, we use it for diagnostic purposes. We use it to kill tumors. We use it to do research to say how old things are. We use it in outer space. Robert mentioned earlier to make the connection with uh, telescopes out there that use all kinds of electromagnetic probes uh, to find out about our universe. Um, we use it as fuel for spacecraft. We use it for electrical power. We even use it to remove pollutants like sulfur dioxides from the environment. And this list goes on. Um, I'm going to skip this because we're running out of time. I want to say that right now, uh, the USA is the world's largest producer of nuclear power, and it accounts for 30% of nuclear generation of electricity. It tells how many um, kilowatts we put out, but we have a problem. These are all the nuclear power plants spread around our country. These are the ones under construction. Two two under construction. It's really, really, really hard to get a license to build a new nuclear power plant. And many of these have been around for quite some time. Oh, and then there's Chernobyl. Personal opinion. This is what, what happened in Chernobyl. We kicked humans out. We kicked humans out of Chernobyl because it was too radioactive to inhabit. And look what happened. These are all beautiful creatures living in Chernobyl. Of course, you could look at Chernobyl like this. You could look at, at the devastation. You could look at the fact that it took out a whole city. You could. And now they give tours of Chernobyl uh, where they will let you in for a limited amount of time. You wear a dosimeter the whole time to make sure that you know exactly how much radiation you're being exposed to. And then you leave and the animals continue happily populating it. In spite of YouTube um, misinformation, there's no uh, three-headed animals in Chernobyl. Uh, that's Photoshop. Uh, there are a higher incidence of tumors. Okay, there are some issues, but when you put that against the fact that humans are not in there um, taking their space and, and destroying their habitat, I would say this turned out to be a win for, for a lot of the animals. Interestingly enough, it affected insects more than some of the mammals. So yeah, Chernobyl, think about it. Um, this is a guy who wrote an article about radiophobia. And I imagine that I, when I read this, it was like parallel to chemophobia, where everyone's afraid of chemicals and now everyone's afraid of radiation. We're just good at being afraid. We're afraid of things we don't understand. Oh, this, this slide's a little out of order. This is where I say that the animals had some issues, cataracts, tumors, maybe some sterility, but life found a way and there were no multi-eyed squirrels or three-headed dogs. So what about Superman's x-ray vision? Let's come back to that. The vision basic is that light goes into the eye and it's detected that way. But an x-ray comes from a source, goes through an object, and the detector is somewhere else. 
So what questions keep me up at night? Well, I'm wondering, does Superman emit rays or does he just receive them? Do, do his x-rays produce heat as well? Um, what's his biological mechanism for being able to generate rays? What is the frequency and the intensity of his radiation? And can he focus it? And if he can focus it, how does he control that? And finally, if he's emitting x-rays, then how does he detect his own emissions to produce the vision? Does he run at super speed to the other side and catch his own x-rays? Can he go faster than the speed of light? These are questions I wonder about. And these are a few books I've read on the topic. And uh, I have a website that I've set up where you can find my sources, my references, and when this recording is um, edited so I can take out the parenthetical remarks about my dog barking at the mailman and things like that, I will put a version of it up at this link for you to peruse. So thank you so much for your audience and any comments or questions at this time.